Hey guys, welcome back to Bambi TV. Guys, today we'll be reacting to Jordan Peterson leave Joe Rogan speechless on the Bible. Whoa, well, guys, let's get straight into this. Many of you have heard about the recent episode of Joe Rogan's podcast where he interviewed the renowned Jordan Peterson. And at a number of points in their conversation, the subject turned to Peterson's views on Christianity, which included a profound explanation of the role of the Bible in the formation of Western civilization. Rogan sat rather spellbound as Peterson detailed what the Bible actually is and its significance for cultivating the world as we know it. And what I found so fascinating by Peterson's explanation was how well it resonated with what cultural anthropologists have been observing about the inherently religious foundations of all civilizations around the world and why our current secular world is beginning to implode. So what I want to do is play you Peterson's explanation of the Bible and then I'm going to compare it to what cultural anthropologists are saying to help us better appreciate why secular liberalism is waning and why a new post-secular age is rising. Categories dis 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 dissolve, especially fundamental ones. The culture is dissolving because the culture is a structure of category. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Right. So, and in fact, culture is a culture is a structure of category that we all share. So we see th things the same way. Well, that's why we can talk. I mean, not exactly the same way because then we'd have nothing to talk about. But roughly speaking, we have a bedrock of agreement. Uh, that's the Bible, by the way. So I just walked through the Museum of the Bible in Washington. That was very cool. It's a very cool museum. So the structure, that's what the Bible Yeah, that's what provides. I figured out. I've been, I just figured this out this week. So it was a cool, it was a cool thing to walk through because it's, it's chronological. They have one floor, which is the history of the Bible. Mm. But it's not exactly that. It's really what it is, is the history of the book. Now, in many ways, the first book was the Bible. I mean, literally, because... At one point, there was only one book, like as far as our Western culture is concerned, there was one book. And for a while, literally, there was only one book. And that book was the Bible. And then before it was the Bible, it was, a, you know, it was scrolls and it was writings on papyrus. And, but it was, we were starting to aggregate written text together. And it went through all sorts of technological transformations. And then it became books that everybody could buy, the book everybody could buy. And the first one of those was the Bible. And then it became all sorts of books that everybody could buy. But all those books, in some sense, emerged out of that underlying book. And that book itself, the Bible isn't a book, it's a library. It's a collection of books. And so, what I figured out was, partly because I was talking to my brother-in-law, Jim Keller, who's the world's greatest chip designer and has now designed a chip that's as powerful as the human brain, which is optimized for artificial intelligence learning, by the way. And so, I talked to him about that. He said... You heard of the internet? I said, yeah, Jim, I've heard of the internet. He said, this is way more revolutionary than that. So in any case, we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text. And Jim said, the meaning of words is coded in the relationship of the words to one another. And the postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words. That's, that's wrong because well, what about rage? That's not words. And what about moving your hand? That's not words. So it's wrong, mm -hmm. but, but part of it's right because the meaning we derive from the verbal domain is encoded in the relationship between words. So, so now then you think, well, let's think about the relationship between words. Well, some words are dependent on other words. Some ideas are dependent on other ideas. The more ideas are dependent on a given idea, the more fundamental that idea is. By de that's a definition of fundamental. So now imagine you have an aggregation of texts in a civilization. And you say, which are the fundamental texts? And the answer is, the texts upon which most other texts depend. And so you'd put Shakespeare way in there in English because so many texts are dependent on Shakespeare's literary revelations. And Milton would be in that category, and Dante would be in that category, at least in translation. Fundamental authors, part of the Western canon, not because of the arbitrary dictates of power, but because those texts influenced more other texts. And then you think about that as a hierarchy, okay, with the Bible at its base. 
which is certainly the case. Now imagine that's the entire corpus of, ling of linguistic production, all things considered. Now how do you understand that? Like literally, how do you understand that? The answer is you sample it by reading and listening to stories and listening to people talk. You sample that whole domain, you build a low resolution representation of that in your, inside you, and then you listen and see through that. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth, which makes it way more true than just true. It's a whole different kind of true. And I think this is, I think this is not only literally the case, factually, I think it can't be any other way. It's the only way we can solve the problem of perception. All right, so what Jordan Peterson just said there, in many respects, should shake all of us out of our ridiculous secularized stupor that's been operative in the West from at least since the end of the 18th century enlightenment, uh, that spent so much time and effort at marginalizing the Bible and pushing it to the periphery of human life. All we need is science, you know, blah, blah, blah. What Peterson just said there exposes how ridiculously and pathetically foolhardy that secularized project has been and why it's losing why we are more and more entering into what scholars call a post-secular world. Now, what Peterson was dealing with there was the profound question, how does a civilization share a common understanding of the world? How is it possible for tens, if not hundreds of millions of people to come to share an overall fundamental point of view, a point of view that's not only shared, but is also unique to any given civilization? Obviously, each one of us has our own unique sense of things. We all have our personal understanding of that fundamental civilizational point of view. But in order for us to communicate, we have to share some perspectives in common. And those perspectives are unique to civilizations. And so in answering that question, Peterson singled out both the verbal and literary domain as the place in which that shared point of view is derived and cultivated. So for Peterson, for many, many scholars, how we perceive the world, our collective point of view, is inevitably shaped by our language, by the words we use, both in speaking and in reading, because words provide a library of meaning for us, which of course, in many ways, starts with our own personal names, right? Our names define us as over and against others, particularly our last names. So words inform our worldview because they provide definition and meaning to life. But what Jordan Peterson didn't mention there is that this has been a major issue for cultural anthropologists for at least the last hundred years in their studies. Cultural anthropologists recognize that words and language can be a huge problem for a functioning social order. I mean, think about it. With words, I can certainly do all kinds of wonderful things, right? I can talk and, and imagine concepts like cosmologies and qualities like good and evil and abstractions like capitalism and, you know, values like honor and chivalry. I can express wishes and dreams. I can use future tense to talk about things to come, past tense to talk about things that were. But I can also use words to deceive, to manipulate, to mislead, in short, to lie. It's so fascinating that in the Bible, the very first sin involved deception with the question, did God really say? So lies are a major problem for any society. And the question is, how do we know who we can trust when we're all capable of lying to each other? But there's another problem as well. And that's the problem that anthropologists call Babel. And this isn't just the problem of other, not understanding other languages, because those would be different civilizations. No, no, here the problem is the inevitability of contradiction within the civilization. If I say Zeus is Lord, inevitably someone's going to come around and say, no, Zeus is not Lord. If I say that person over there is a good person, inevitably someone else is going to come in and say, no, 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 that person is a bad person. And here's the problem. Who's right? 
two contradictory statements cannot both be true at the same time and in the same context. As Aristotle would point out, all you'd have to do is argue with me and you've proved the point. You'd be arguing for one position as over and against its opposite. Two contradictory views cannot both be true at the same time and same context. So how do we know who's right, especially if we all could be lying? The use of language is a major obstacle to a functioning social order. Now, cultural anthropologists have long recognized that there's actually only one solution to this problem of the lie and of Babel. There's only one thing that can ultimately overcome this confusion, and that one solution is, in a single word, religion. Cultural anthropologists have long recognized that religion alone provides the solution to the problem of the lie and the babble. And this is because historic religions forge what scholars call the sacred. And the sacred is a particular kind of discourse. It's a particular kind of speech or text that's set apart from everything else. That's what we mean by sacred, right? It's completely and wholly removed from mundane life. It's set apart from everything else in that it expresses what is unequivocally, absolutely, and unquestionably true. And the point here is that the sacred has to be true. It's not proven to be true, because why? Because whatever you're using to prove its truth is itself the sacred. Its truth is unquestioned and absolute. You see, we, there's really no way we can get around this. Every civilization has to have a fundamental starting point that not only is absolute, it has to be absolute. It has to be unquestionable in and of itself. Otherwise, we'll never get past the problem of the lie. If the sacred could just as easily lie as anything else, then by definition, it's not sacred. It's not completely set apart and uncontaminated by the mundane. The sacred, by definition, cannot possibly lie. And so once we have a sacred word, given to us by a source that is itself sacred, hence God or the gods or divine being in some sense. Once we have a sacred word, now we can resolve the problem of the lie. We have absolute truth upon which to establish our social order. The sacred establishes truth and is therefore able to decide who's right among all the Babel, right? All the differing contradictory opinions. This is what Jordan Peterson means when he talks about the Bible being way more true than just truth, right? For Western civilization, the Bible is the foundation of truth. It's the precondition for the manifestation of truth. And therefore, it is no coincidence that the more we marginalize the foundation of truth from our society, the harder it will be to define what a woman is. Now, of course, Rogan has said some pretty dumb things about the Bible in the past, particularly the New Testament. And what Peterson is calling him out on, at least inadvertently, is that the moment Rogan starts beating up on the Bible, whether he likes it or not, Rogan is ultimately deferring to an alternative sacred, an alternative foundation that is assumed to be every bit as unquestionable and absolute as Western civilization believed the Bible once was. And I'd be very curious to probe whether that alternative sacred could even remotely match the civilizational power and influence of the Bible, which civilizational scholars admit is utterly extraordinary. Peterson got into the uh, verbal domain, the literary canon inspired by the Bible, Augustine, Dante, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Solzhenitsyn, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Our musical tradition from Gregorian chant to Johann Sebastian Bach, our artistic tradition of Michelangelo and Raphael and Rembrandt rooted in the church's iconography, our architectural tradition inspired by visions of the new creation. Many European cathedrals are 144 cubits tall, which corresponds to the height of the city of God in the book of Revelation. Our legal tradition, which is rooted in the medieval canon law of the church. Our economic system, credit, is a term derived from the Latin credo, which means I believe. Credit was considered in the medieval church a domain of faith. We could go on and on and on. The Bible is indeed the foundation for how Western civilization developed over the last 2,000 years, which makes it the single most unique book of our culture and society. Jordan Peterson 
mentioned having this epiphany while he visited the Bible Museum in D.C. I've been there, and after walking up a cascading set of glass stairs to the first floor, I encountered a prominent sign summarizing the museum. Perhaps no other book in history has had a greater impact than the Bible. It is the most widely published book ever, read by people in thousands of languages all over the world. In some cultures, its stories, expressions, and ideas have been so thoroughly absorbed, they seem almost invisible. The exhibits in these galleries invite you to discover the Bible's presence around you, often in unexpected places, hidden in plain sight. I can think of no better description for what Jordan Peterson has just done for all of us. Now, before you go, you will definitely want to check out my other video on Jordan Peterson teaching Joe Rogan about the cross. You're not going to want to miss that. So make sure to click on the link and I'll see you over there. Guys, this video is amazing. I will say the Bible is the truth based on the fact that it is the truth. So it has the only part I'm going to give you. But if we want to be honest, like, even the Quran will say she judge the Bible, we should use the Bible to judge the Quran. And based on the fact that the Bible has been there since it is, is the world's most sold book. Like, it's the, it's the most sold book in the world, but like, I just said, even the first, if you want to be honest, the Bible has been there and will be there. And the test from the Bible, if you want to be honest with yourself, like, you can see great, great, great men that have come and left. Guys, great men have advised about the Bible. Like, it's, it's there. Like, most of them say, even if you don't join Christianity, like, take what the Bible is giving you. Like, it's a book that helped a lot of people. But guys, tell me what you think about this video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe to my channel. Leave a comment in the comment section, guys. I'll see you next time, guys.